I believe in love that is born in the song of a baby's cry. I believe in love that lives on and on even when we die. I believe in love the reaches out, embracing all our pain and doubt. I believe in that love. I believe, I believe in that love. I believe in love. I believe in that love. I believe, I believe in that love. I believe in love. I believe in love that is felt in the touch of a helping hand. I believe in love that sees different. I believe in the love. I believe in love. I believe in the love. I believe. I believe in the love. I believe in love. I believe in love that is here at the heart of a mystery. I believe in love that forgives, forgets. Heals and sets us free. Sets us free. I believe in love that loses self for the sake of life for someone else. I believe in that love. I believe. I believe in that love. I believe in love. I believe in that love. I believe. I believe in that love. I believe in that love. I believe. I believe in that love. Good morning. I'm Bishop Jim Dunlop, the Bishop of the Lower Susquehanna Synod, and this is the worship for the Lower Susquehanna Synod on the 14th Sunday after Pentecost. We begin our worship with the brief order of confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who forgives all our sin, whose mercy endures forever. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and one another. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have turned from you and given ourselves into the power of sin. We are truly sorry and humbly repent. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things we have done and things we have failed to do. Turn us again to you and uphold us by your Spirit, so that we may live and serve you in the newness of life, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with the power through the Holy Spirit that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. And now we will join together where we are by singing hymn number 532 in the ELW, Gather Us In.
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, and also with you. And now, the hymn of praise will be performed by Faith X, the praise band from Trinity Lutheran Church in Camp Hill.
Let us pray. O Lord God, enliven and preserve your church with your perpetual mercy. Without your help, we mortals will fail. Remove far from us everything that is harmful and lead us toward all that gives life and salvation. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. A reading from Ezekiel. So you mortal, I have made a sentinel for the house of Israel. Whenever you hear a word from my mouth, you shall give them warning from me. If I say to the wicked, O wicked ones, you will surely die, and you do not speak to warn the wicked to turn from their ways, the wicked shall die in their iniquity, but their blood I will require at your hand. But if you warn the wicked to turn from their ways, and they do not turn from their ways, the wicked shall die in their iniquity, but you will have saved your life. Now you, mortal, say to the house of Israel, thus you have said, our transgressions and our sins weigh upon us, and we waste away because of them. How then can we live? Say to them, as I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from their ways and live. Turn back, turn back from your evil ways. For why will you die, O house of Israel? Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Owe no one anything except to love one another. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word, love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. Besides this, you know what time it is, how it is now the moment for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we became believers. The night is far gone, the day is near. Let us then lay aside the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us live honorably as in the day, not in reveling and drunkenness, not in debauchery and licentiousness, not in quarreling and jealousy. Instead, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Well, I'd like our young people to um, join me and for a brief time. I brought my friend Lucy with me. <coughs> Lucy, what do you got here? I brought the rules of golf. You brought the rules of golf? What were you doing with those? Well, I was studying them because I thought I'd take up golf. Why do you want to play golf? There's a lot of grass out there, you know. Oh, well, yes, there is. Uh, how's the rules going? It seems complicated. There is rules about when your ball lands on an anthill and what happens and when you can clean it and when you can't. And it just seems so complicated. Well, I don't know. And... Did you notice? It smells like a wolf in here. A wolf? Here in Camp Hill? There are no wolves in Camp Hill. I can tell. I could tell when we had to go to Trinity Mount Joy and there was that dog, JJ. Well, I don't know about that. But there are rules. Rules help us in lots of different ways. They help us to stay safe and to help us to know what's right and what's wrong. The Bible has rules. There's over 613 commandments in the Bible. What? That's too many. Well, there's 10 that we really kind of focus on in terms of the 10 commandments of loving God, respecting God's name, paying attention to the Sabbath day, which is holy, honoring our parents, not killing anyone, um, not stealing, not lying. All of those things are things that keep us safe and are important. But it's too many things to remember. Well, that's where Paul comes in in the lesson we just heard in Romans. 
he kind of summarizes all the law down to two things that you could remember. Do you think you can remember two things? Yeah. Well, the two things are that you should love God and you should love your neighbor. And if you can remember those two things, all the laws hang on those two things. Those are the two things that you need to remember. Oh, and who is my neighbor? Well, that's a whole, another lesson for another day. But let's just remind ourselves that perhaps if we run into a wolf, that could be your neighbor too. I don't think so. I don't like wolves. Well, okay. Well, how about if we say a prayer together? Good and gracious and loving God, we give thanks to you because you are the source of all love. Guide us and lead us that we may love our neighbors as well. Amen. You can stay here. The Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said to the disciples, If another member of the church sins against you, go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. If the member listens to you, you have regained that one. But if you are not listened to, take one or two others along with you, so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If the member refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if the offender refuses to listen even to the church, let such a one be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly, I tell you, Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly I tell you, if two of you agree on earth about anything you ask, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. This Matthew text is one of the beautiful texts in Scripture. It reveals the nature of our life in Christian community and how it is that we are to live with one another. But unfortunately, I think too often it can be used as a club. It becomes grounds for punishment in the church and a model for excommunication. It's about how you throw someone out of the community of faith. But that is not at all really its purpose. This passage points to our life together. Life in community. Is this not the very thing to which Jesus pointed at the end of this when he beautifully says, for where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. For those of us in the church, there is a powerful, there is a parallel expression. Where two or three are gathered in Christ's name, there is conflict. I remember a story from my mentor, Pastor Stuart Hardy, who shared with me about his first congregation. There were two more mature members of the congregation council, and for the sake of this story, we will just call them Hans and Otto, good Pennsylvania Dutchmen, perhaps a bit set in their ways and a bit opinionated, and they often seem to be the nay votes on new ideas in the congregation. There was one idea, though, that they agreed on. They agreed there needed to be a light in the parking lot of the church. Now, Otto thought it was such a good idea that he was willing to fund the purchase of the light. And Hans, who was the chair of the property committee, agreed to install it. But the problem was Otto thought it should be put on a pole at the far end of the parking lot. Hans thought it would be far easier to just mount the light on the building. Well, Otto paid for the light, but Hans, who was the property chair, installed it on the building. 
Otto was furious that it had not been installed properly on a pole. And so after a week or two, Otto hired some contractors and they came and put a pole into the parking lot, put the light on the pole. Later, Hans came during the night and moved it back onto the building. This went on for some time. Eventually, someone came to Pastor Hardy and said, you need to step in with Hans and Otto. But Pastor Hardy observed that while they had been moving the light around, there were so many other things that were moving forward in the congregation because Hans and Otto's attention was completely on the light. Where two or three are gathered, there is conflict. People who are outside of the church often criticize the church because of conflict and poor behavior by those of us in the church. The expression that often is heard is that church members seem hypocritical. Well, the church is full of sinners. And here's the thing. Jesus knew this. Why else would we have this teaching? A teaching on how to deal with sin, conflict, and brokenness in the church. The important thing to hear is what Jesus was saying about conflict and brokenness and how to deal with it. Not that there never would be conflict, but how in a loving Christian community do we deal with these things? And the important thing to hear first is that Christianity is done in community. And the community cares for the least and the lost and the lonely. And we know this from Jesus' teaching immediately in front of this text. Jesus warns that anyone who would cause an innocent child in their vulnerability to stumble, that they would be better off to be thrown into a sea with a stone tied around their neck. And the very next teaching that Jesus has right before this lesson is the story of a hundred sheep. And one of them gets lost and the good shepherd goes off to find that one. Now we live in a culture that places high value on the individual and individual freedom. And so we're grateful that Jesus watches out for each of us individually. And yet that's not how this story is often heard in places around the world, particularly in Africa, where community is valued above all else. They hear the story of the shepherd as one who is willing to risk their life to find the one in order to restore the community. And perhaps that's closer to what the early teaching of the church was about, the importance of living in community. And we often say things in our culture from our perspective of individual freedom. It's my life and I can do what I want with it. I'm free, this is a free country. But that's not what this lesson really says. Our individual sins, our individual brokenness, has an impact on the community. Our being lost is a break in the community. It is a tear in the fabric of the community. Our choices impact the people around us, our family, and our community. The commandments are about our relationship with God but most of the commandments are about our relationship with one another in community. And we do have freedom, and Luther talked about our freedom eloquently when he said, a Christian is perfectly free Lord of all, subject to none. And a Christian is a perfectly dutiful servant of all, subject to all. Freed by faith, which is a gift of God's mercy. A dutiful servant to all, because we live and care for our neighbor in community. 
Jesus here in Matthew's gospel gives a clear process to resolve sin, brokenness, and conflict. And the key is restorative justice. There really are two kinds of justice, punitive justice and restorative justice. Punitive is when you do something wrong and you are punished. That's the problem when this text is used as a way to throw someone out of the community as punishment. But look how it's structured. If someone sins, you go to speak to them one-on-one, privately, with the hope of restoring the relationship, to speak, and more importantly, to listen, to work to restore the relationship and community. I will know you find this hard to believe, but occasionally people will call the bishop's office to complain about their deacon or pastor. I listen carefully, and the first question I ask is, did you talk to your pastor or deacon? And most times, the answer is no. Now, they've complained to lots of other people. Generally, I call those kind of events parking lot meetings. They're the meeting that happens in the parking lot of the church after the meeting inside of the building. To go and have an honest conversation with someone one-on-one can be uncomfortable. Welcome to the Christian community. If Jesus was willing to die on the cross, are we willing to have some uncomfortable conversations for the sake of one another? If you're not, then you don't live in community but rather in a pseudo-community, a kind of false community, a community filled with empty smiles and fake niceness. And what if one that you talk to does not accept your assessment of the situation? Then you take two or one or two others with you. I would not recommend taking those who just simply agree with you, but take people that are respected by you and the person with whom you have conflict. Be open to listening more than stating your case. It's possible that you both can grow and the community can be strengthened. And finally, these issues can be taken before the church. But the goal is always to restore that which is broken before, in a quiet conversation, where the issues are not made public. The last thing that the lesson points out is we have a responsibility to the community. We have the responsibility to point out when one of us in the community has made an error. It's one of the things that I have appreciated in my role as bishop. People who come to me in love to point out where I've been wrong, and that certainly happens. How else will we be better if we do not have people that can honestly come and sit with us and point out the ways in which we have erred? It is the joy for me of working with a team of both the synod officers and the staff of the synod because I believe we have what is a genuine community together as we do the work that we have been called to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. We've been in this interesting time of pandemic. We've been unable to worship in person or very limited and unable to break break bread together. We've been hungering for the very thing that this lesson lifts up. We are hungering to be in community, to be together to be the body of Christ physically together. This time will pass. I don't know when, but we will gather again in community. And we, and we know that whether it is with hundreds of people together or just two or three, 
Christ is present. That is the good news. Because Jesus has promised, for where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. Jesus reminds us that we are going to have conflict. And Jesus gives us the grace and freedom to care for one another. And through Christ's death and resurrection, we too can experience new life, even in the brokenness and conflict that comes in living in community. So I will leave you with a question today. When we come back into life in the community after the pandemic, what kind of community will we want that to be? One in which we speak honestly with one another face to face for the sake of the whole community? Or one in which we speak about others because it's too uncomfortable to speak the truth and to be open to hear the truth about ourselves? Will we spend our energy on things that we seem to always spend energy on? The color of carpeting, the color of hymnals, or the position of the light in the parking lot? Or will we spend our energy on becoming the beloved community of Christ? The one thing I know for sure, Jesus will be genuinely and vulnerably present as he was on the cross. Will we be willing to do the same for one another? Amen.
whole church, let us confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Drawn together in the compassion of God, we pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. Unite your church, O God. Thank you for being with us in whatever manner we gather to worship you, that two or three may be gathered not only in physical buildings, but in new ways. Grant us the gifts of repentance and reconciliation. Bless the cooperative work of churches in our synod and all of our communities. Strengthen ecumenical partnerships. God of mercy, hear our prayer. Bless our bishops, Elizabeth and Jim, and all our pastors and deacons. Give them health and energy for the work of your church in this difficult time, and remind them that to care for others, they must care for themselves too. Direct all of us to remember that loving our neighbor is the fulfilling of the law. God of mercy, hear our prayer. Protect your creation, O God. Teach us ways that do not harm what you have entrusted to our care. Renew and enlighten place, enliven places suffering from drought, flood, storms, or pollution. God of mercy, hear our prayer. Turn nations and leaders from ways that lead to death. Shape new paths toward peace and cooperation, teaching us to recognize one another as neighbors. Point those in authority to policies and laws that protect the well-being of all. Care for health workers, first responders, and those who do not have a choice to stay home and be safe from the coronavirus. Guide scientists and health experts as they seek to find treatments and vaccines. God of mercy, hear our prayer. Tend to all in need of your compassion. Hear the cries of those awaiting justice and those yearning for forgiveness. Give community to the lonely and neighbors to the outcast. Shelter all who are vulnerable in body, mind, or spirit. Bring healing to those we lift before you now. God of mercy, hear our prayer. Sustain us in our work, O God, that we lay aside the works of darkness. Give work to those who need it. Shape societies to ensure fair treatment for all who labor. Care for those who have lost their job. Help us to love our neighbors in and through our work. God of mercy, hear our prayer. We remember with thanksgiving those who have died in faith. As you equip them, equip us with your protection and power until with them we see your salvation. God of mercy, hear our prayer. All these things and whatever else you see that we need, we entrust to your mercy through Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. I would ask, wherever you are, that you share the peace with those that are around you. Normally in our worship time together, this would be a time for offering as we offer gifts back to God. Um, we are not physically together, but your congregations are grateful for your generosity. Throughout our synod, many of our congregations have reported to me the wonderful generosity of our, their members, either through online giving or by mailing in their gifts to the church. So please consider making a gift to your congregation this day. Let us pray. O God of justice and love, we give thanks to you that you illumine our way through life with the words of your Son. Give us the light we need, 
awaken us to the needs of others, and at the end, bring all the world to your feast. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory forever. Amen. And gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Just some brief announcements. I certainly want to thank Lucinda Bringman, um, Vice President of our Synod, and Joe Stepanski, um, Treasurer of our Synod, for assisting with worship today. A special thanks to Trinity Lutheran Church here in Camp Hill, um, the hospitality of Pastor Horner, Fry, and Brock, as well as the musicians that contributed to the service, um, the organist and music director, Tim Koch, um, Debbie Wilson, who leads the Faith X group um, and their contribution, and especially to the technical team who is here assisting us this morning with the recording of this service. We are grateful for all of their gifts that have made this worship possible. And now, the God of steadfastness and encouragement grant you to live in harmony with one another in accordance with Jesus Christ. Amen. The God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And the God of all grace bless you now and forever. Amen. Go forth into the world to serve God with gladness. Be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Render to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Honor all people. Love and serve God, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Thanks be to God. <laughs> 